In 1996, the newly elected John Howard took to the stage in Gippsland, Victoria. Secured with a bulletproof vest, the Prime Minister stood face to face against an angry crowd, furious that Howard had ordered a buyback on semi-automatic and automatic weapons. A death threat had already been made to the Prime Minister, but unlike his inflammatory predecessor Paul Keating, John Howard wasn't seeking conflict and calmly stated that this needed to be done after the Port Arthur massacre, where 35 people had been gunned down before answering each of the crowd's questions. To the media's surprise, the angry crowd proved to be of no threat and Howard exited unharmed, with some even suggesting he pacified the crowd. Beyond that, his gun control reforms would be held up as the example for America to follow still decades later. And above all, in 2011, JWS found that 50% of Australians regarded Howard as the best of the last five Prime Ministers. But what if there was more to the story? What if I told you that John Howard's government cost the nation $1.3 trillion? So we left the Keating episode with him being smashed by Howard in the 1996 election, 94 seats to 49. What you might not know is just how crazy the chronology is. So Howard was elected in March, but just six weeks later came Port Arthur, the worst massacre in Australian history. Now, as Howard testified to in later interviews, the fact that he had such a big majority meant that he felt emboldened to take immediate action after the massacre, putting restrictions on most uses of semi-automatic and automatic weapons. This was supported by Kim Beasley's Labor, and after years of Keating destroying the Liberals in the lower house, it seemed as though Australia was set for a golden age of bipartisanship. That lasted all of two minutes. You see, Howard viewed himself as something like the second coming of Menzies. He even replaced Keating's old chair to restore the model that Menzies had used. And much like Menzies believed, for Howard, the unions had too strong a stranglehold on the bureaucracy and needed to be cleaned out. Howard sacked one third of the departmental heads, but if you've watched the Menzies episode, you might remember that this was very much an un-Menzies move as he had kept much of Chifley's personnel in to retain the expertise. Not only that, but Howard engaged in the dark arts of realpolitik. You see, despite smashing Keating in the lower house, the Liberals only held 37 out of 76 seats, falling just too short of a majority. When word reached Howard that Labor Senator Mal Constan was feeling discontent within the Labor Party, Howard swooped, offering him Senate Vice Presidency for defecting. This wasn't too many shades off of the actions of his Liberal New South Wales Premier counterpart, Nick Greiner, who'd earlier been taken down by ICAC for essentially removing a political opponent by offering him a job in the EPA. Hey John, either way we can defeat Labor once and for all and get the GST throw the Senate. One step ahead of you, explain how you got these scars. Constant jumped at the chance to be Vice President of the Senate, and though this was viewed as a little dirty, it was a clear win for Howard in paving a path to get through the Senate. But Howard was plagued with yet another personnel issue. You see, in the 1996 election, the Liberals had put forward a candidate in the Labor stronghold of Oxley in Queensland, knowing that they wouldn't win. Her name was Pauline Hanson. Yep, and it gets even crazier. So you know how I said the Libs knew that she wouldn't win and they were farming one of their more radical candidates out to an unwinnable area? Well, she actually won. But yet the story still gets even crazier. In the build-up to the election, Hanson said that the government should abolish government assistance to Indigenous Australians. For this, the Liberals disendorsed her as a party candidate, but this wasn't done in time for the election and on the ticket she was still officially a Liberal. Howard said that if she won, she wouldn't form part of the party, and so Hanson was left as a rogue operator in the lower house. And on this issue, Howard found himself wedged. Howard had run on a campaign of anti-political correctness and that Paul Keating of all people had gone woke, so if Howard came out against Pauline Hanson, he'd alienate much of his own voting base. And so Howard did the Howard special. Seriously, watch this in his interviews. One of his most common deflections for criticism is by saying how good it is to live in a country where those criticisms can be made freely. And so on the Pauline Hanson issue, Howard refused to censure her as many were pressuring him to do, saying that fighting against political correctness would allow people to quote, speak a little more freely and a little more openly about what they feel. However, pacifying the cultural right of the party risked angering the metropolitan business elites who didn't have the same appetite for divisive culture war issues. 
And it would be on the issue of an apology to indigenous people that Howard would face very threatening opposition, even from his own treasurer, Peter Costello. But before we get there, we need to look into the $1.3 trillion heist that Howard and Costello started to pull on the Australian people. Now, Howard had come into office promising two things. One, that Medicare would be kept. Previous liberals like Fraser had campaigned on scaling it back. But two, that there would never, ever be a goods and services tax under Howard. There's no way that uh, GST will ever be part of our policy. Never, ever. Never, ever. It's dead. Remember that one. But if there's one thing you need to know about Howard, it's that he obsessed over one key economic metric. Is the budget in surplus or is it in deficit at the end of the financial year? He kind of reminds you of your dad after you got your first Hungry Jack's paycheck. Now son, you need to save, 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 not spend, spend, spend. But funnily enough, managing an economy is not like managing your 15 year old finances and constraining the amount of packs you open on Ultimate Team. You see, just like in business, there are a number of good reasons to go into debt such as staying afloat during a financial crisis or in investing in technology which will create future surpluses for decades. The really important metric is what we call a structural surplus. Essentially, if left to itself, does the state of the economy create surpluses down the track? Now, it's totally true that Keating left Howard with a $9 billion deficit, but again, the real question is was the economy left in a structural deficit in which the answer was no. Keating's treasury reforms such as floating the Aussie dollar and integrating Australia into Asian markets had completely revolutionised the Australian economy. However, Howard was obsessed with removing all connotations of deficit and slash the public sector. Essentially, over two years there were $8 billion in budget cuts applied to everything from education to health, but importantly, not the military. Tyrannus, there are budget cuts coming. Will I have a job? I am sure Lord Sidious will have something to say. You answer to me now. Sorry, that's a big graphic, but I'm really trying to get across that Howard had a ruthless streak in him and he isn't just your grandpa. Also, I'm going to make this my subscriber question. Who would you prefer as PM, John Howard or ScoMo? And let the comments explode. Now, Howard also aimed to reduce the deficit by selling off public assets. The first that came into the firing line was Telstra, which had one third sold for $3.3 billion in 1997, with the next instalment being $7.4 billion in 1999. Howard also defunded the Commonwealth Employment Scheme and had it largely incorporated into Centrelink. In 1998, Howard had worked a miracle and brought the budget back into surplus. But the issue of a structural surplus still remained. Gutting education and healthcare would create more economic issues down the track, while privatising essential services would see an increased cost of living put onto Australians. So how do you deal with that issue? Well, as early back as the 1980s, Treasurer Paul Keating had proposed a GST to Bob Hawke in order to tax consumption rather than income. Hawke declined this, but this idea had made some momentum within the Liberal Party, with John Hewson incorporating it into his Fight Back campaign while opposition leader to Keating. Ironically, Keating used the public distrust of the GST against Hewson. Remember, Howard promised to never have the GST be a part of Liberal policy, but under pressure from the business community, changed his mind. A tax on consumption rather than a tax on profits would certainly serve their interests. Beasley opposed the GST and this would be the signature policy debate going into the 1998 election. Despite suffering a swing against him, Howard's Liberals held on 80 seats to 67 seats and Howard considered this as the public's tick of approval for the GST. Crazily, Hanson held on to her seat as the leader of the new One Nation. However, once again, Howard had a Senate minority and with Labor opposing the GST, he needed some help to get it over the line and he turned to the Democrats. You're a despicable soul, our Prime Minister Howard. How could you go to the Democrats? No, no, Ben. The thing that you need to understand about Australia is that the Democrats are like what the Greens are to Labor for the Liberals. Sometimes you have to deal with the devil. No, nope. all I think with Green is AOC. So unable to get it through with just coalition votes, Howard courted the votes of the Democrats and eventually got a 10% GST through Parliament. But we need to ask ourselves the question, with Howard bringing the budget back into surplus in 1998, how then did he spend the money? Was it just on defence? Well, there's two ways that you can spend money. Firstly, you can invest it in infrastructure or services, or you can cut taxes as that effectively limits the amount of revenue that you have. 
and Howard dished out the tax cuts. Oh my, I can't believe I just criticized this guy. So the corporate tax rate was slashed from 36% to 30%. Income taxes wouldn't really be slashed until his later time in office, but then there was the most significant tax cut, the halving of the capital gains tax. You see, Keating had put the capital gains tax in to disincentivize speculative investing and to encourage productivity rather than just flipping things like houses. When Howard halved it, this encouraged property investors to snap up property, which created heaps more investment, not to mention that people like first home buyers were then priced out at the auction. Unfortunately, this led to a property bubble, but this was a necessary evil to get Lux listing Sydney. The Sydney real estate market right now. Wow, it is booming. Now I'm going to go full circle and come back to Howard and the Indigenous issue. After Keating's Redfern speech, the course for Australian policy had been set. No longer were Indigenous issues a matter of self-determination, but now it was an issue of reconciliation, and that could best be achieved by an apology from the Australian government. Howard dug his feet in and refused to go along with this on the premise that it implied collective guilt and denigrated the individuality of man. Basically, an academic way of saying, Miss, I didn't even do it. Why should I apologize for something that Skimo did? So back in 1997, Howard gave a speech at the Australian Reconciliation Convention in Melbourne, signaling his wishes to proceed with reconciliation. However, once again, he repudiated any notion of an apology and angered the crowd by calling the treatment of Indigenous Australians as just a blemish on Australia's history. In the year 2000, 250,000 people walked across Sydney Harbour Bridge in a walk for reconciliation. Howard declined to participate and even had to talk Peter Costello out of participating. As part of his 1998 election campaign, Howard had also campaigned on putting a referendum to the Australian people on whether or not we should be a republic. Kim Beasley's Labor was united behind voting yes to be a republic, however, Howard allowed a conscience vote within his own party. One of the young Liberal MPs, Tony Abbott, became the face of the no vote, while a future Liberal MP, Malcolm Turnbull, became the face of the yes vote. This was a calculated gamble from Howard, who would go on to vocalise his support for the monarchy, and the no vote ended up winning convincingly. When it came to foreign policy, Howard was clear. Keating's pivot to Asia was to be slowed down, and Australia ought to turn back to the US and the UK. This would prove to be more influential a little bit later, but in his first two terms, Howard made a revolutionary foreign policy decision. In 1976, Indonesia had annexed East Timor, and the Australian government recognised Indonesia's legitimacy to the claim. However, in 1998, Indonesia's President Suharto resigned and was replaced with a guy called BJ Habibi, who suggested that East Timor be recognised as an autonomous zone within Indonesia. Howard took this as an opportunity to change the foreign policy approach, and suggested that East Timor hold a referendum on independence in 10 years. Habibe basically suggested going one better and holding it within six months, supervised by the UN. This provoked all sorts of violence from pro-integration groups in East Timor, and Howard requested that a UN peacekeeping force be put on the ground. Habibi rejected this and the referendum was held, with East Timor voting for independence. The integration groups retaliated and war broke out. With bipartisan support, Howard placed 4,500 soldiers on the ground and led the world in a peacekeeping effort. When what forces on the ground now, the opposition leader does support this. Copy, Mr. Howard. In less than a month, order was largely restored. Foreign policy hadn't occupied much of Howard's brain space, and with the success of East Timor, Howard's confidence in intervention would only grow. However, in 2001, Howard started to seem stale. Keating had captured the imagination of the nation and had a vision for what it could become. Under Howard, it wasn't clear where the nation was going. On Indigenous issues, Australia seemed to stall. On foreign policy, Howard had pivoted away from Keating's vision for Asian integration. And apart from the GST, what significant economic reforms could Howard hang his hat on? With the election to be held at the end of 2001, the Liberals were down in the polls and looked poised to lose. On the 10th of September, Howard visited new President George H.W. Bush for their first meeting. The next day, the course of history would change forever. Come back next week to see a story that even tops this one. Iraq, the Solomons, and actually seeing where exactly that $1.3 trillion sum went to. If you can't wait until then, watch this video on how the CIA and the Crown took down Gough Whitlam.